Hello and welcome to GameSack. This time we're doing a show that a lot of you have requested. We're finally doing it. The original Xbox. The mighty Xbox. So mighty, in fact, that I've always wondered what it looks like on the inside of this huge box that's like this big or something. It's pretty big. <laughs> but I imagine you've got a video for us to watch. And uh, let's, let's see. Yeah, let's check out the Xbox. The Microsoft Xbox was released in November of 2001 and was the company's very first home console. It launched only two days before the Nintendo GameCube and also competed with the mighty PlayStation 2. The 8.5 pound console originally launched with a giant controller called the Duke, but people complained about its size. This was quickly replaced with a controller meant for the Japanese market called the Controller S. And the Xbox controllers feature exciting black and white buttons to increase the enjoyment factor of every game on the system. A year after the console was released, the Xbox Live Online service launched. The Xbox was the first console to only offer broadband support and not any dial-up options. The Xbox was also by far the most robust console of its generation. It was powered by a 32-bit 733 MHz Pentium 3, 64 MB of RAM, with graphics drawn by an NVIDIA NV2A running at 233 MHz. That's right, it can put over 100 polygons on the screen. Also a popular media player when modded, the Xbox had just over 1,000 games and sold over 22 million units worldwide. Only 2 million of that in Japan. Eight and a half pounds? Indeed. Dude, I wasn't even that big when I was born. I know, right? I bet you weren't either. It was a damn heavy console. Wow. And, and it still is. And it still is. <laughs> yeah. It hasn't gotten any lighter. Exactly. <laughs> anyway, what is a console without the games? Let's take a look at some of the games. Yeah, we've got a lot. Here's Panzer Dragoon Orta by Sega's Smilebit team. It's a very solid entry into this series of rail shooters and plays just like the first two games with a few new additions. First and foremost is the ability to morph your dragon. There's three different types and each one is useful. The small dragon can't lock onto enemies, but he has a huge reticle and machine gun-like weapon and he's fast. The medium dragon can lock onto a bunch of targets and is a bit more powerful. The big dragon is very strong, but can only lock onto a few targets at once and he's slow. Your dragons all now have speed boosts or can even slow down if needed. The Berserk weapon is still here, and so is all the fun of the previous games. There's just something about this style of gameplay that's simple and fun, but still very challenging. This is in no way an easy game, but it's so pretty that you just want to keep trying. The graphics are very nice and are all presented in widescreen and 480p, and it looks great on modern TVs. Keep in mind that this game and a few others won't run in 480p on later Xbox consoles, though they can be patched if you have a modded Xbox, though that didn't work at all for Joe. Poor Joe. The soundtrack, while not as great as the first game, is still very enjoyable. A must own for your system. Jet Set Radio Future is another game by Sega's Smilebit. Released in 2002, this is a reimagining of the first game on the Dreamcast. It features similar levels and characters even though some of them are altered a bit. Basically, you're rolling around covering up other games' graffiti with your own gang's tags. After you cover up all the graffiti, you'll race or mimic another graffiti artist. If you beat him, he'll join your gang. And after that, you do get to fight the police. You do this by knocking them down and spray painting their backs. I actually really like this game. The skating is fun and grinding on everything is easy. The cel shaded graphics look really good and everyone dances. It's funny watching the characters dance while having a conversation with each other. And of course you can't dance without good music, right? Well the music in here definitely fits the gameplay. It's not something that I'd add to my personal music library, but while I'm playing the game it sounds really good. Definitely a great addition to the Xbox library, and it eventually became a pack-in with the console. Jade Empire is an action RPG from Bioware. Well, there's really not a whole lot to the RPG part, but it's definitely not straight up action. You choose a character and your style in the beginning of the game. And like you'd expect from a Bioware title, there's lots of text and you're given choices on how to respond. The characters in the game will react differently depending on how you respond, so be sure you're saying what you really want to say. 
And there's lots of this stuff throughout the game. Basically, you start out as a star student of a martial arts school somewhere in China. You have three different life bars which corresponds to body, mind, and spirit. And of course, if the body bar empties in battle, you die. So that's the one you really want to keep your eye on. However, you can spend chi if you have it to restore your body bar when your life gets low. You start out fighting regular bandits, but soon you're fighting ghosts and of course they have life bars too. You can switch between styles when fighting by pressing one of the directions on the D-pad. As a game, it's not bad and so far I haven't gotten bored at all, even with all of the dialogue. The graphics are pretty good, but the frame rate is variable. In fact, it's all over the place. The sound and music do the job and all the dialogue except for yours is voiced. Now it's definitely not well voiced, but it's not cringeworthy or anything, not like GameSack. Master Lee keeps talking about Restless Dead, but there's nothing like that around here. Now I haven't played it too much, but so far I definitely recommend it and it was also released on the PC and Mac. This is The Chronicles of Riddick Escape from Butcher Bay. This is a first person action stealth type of game that apparently takes place before the movie. I've never seen the movie though. The game stars the voice and likeness of Vin Diesel who is also involved in the development. It also features the voices of other people you may or may not recognize. Though you'd better recognize Dwight Schultz, he was part of the A-team down in engineering in Star Trek The Next Generation. Basically the story goes that you're Riddick and now you're in Butcher Bay prison and you want out. The game works pretty well and it's not just a first person shooter with stealth elements. There's lots of inmates to talk to and often you're going to have to do favors for them if you want to advance the game. No, not those kind of favors, get your mind out of the gutter you sicko. These favors usually revolve around killing a specific individual or getting an item or things like that. Often you're fighting with your bare fists but you can get other weapons to help you out. Guns can be hard to come by since they're DNA encoded and if you don't have the right DNA you can't use them. Unless you can get into the mainframe where all that info lives, of course. The game's visuals are, of course, dark and dreary. For some reason, you don't see too many happy, bright colors in Butcher Bay Prison. The field of view is quite wide, which is odd for a console game. Surprisingly, I didn't get any motion sickness while playing this one, and I played it for quite a while. The sound design is really well done, with great 5.1 Dolby Digital surround that comes from all over the place. This one was also released on a PC, but if you want to play it on a console, then you've got to get it on the Xbox. The Dark, my favorite. Here's Blinks the Time Sweeper, developed by R2 and released in 2002. This is a very interesting game with some crazy play mechanics that ultimately ends up being a fun adventure. Firstly, the game's titular protagonist is a cat. Did you just say tits? Now I'm really not a cat person, so this might have swayed me from buying it back in the day, but after I played it I realized that you can't always judge a game by its hero. So each world has three levels in a boss fight. Inside the levels, your goal is to destroy all the enemies and get to the exit. You have a 10 minute timer to get this done, and if you don't, I'm guessing something bad will happen. Don't worry about the time though, because you really won't have any problems killing everything. The thing that makes this game so interesting are the time controls. You'll pick up crystals throughout a level, and if you get three or four of the same one, you gain the ability to manipulate time. You can do things like pause time, which will make everything in the level stop except for you. You can also slow down time, which will make everything slow down except for you. You can even rewind time, which will, for example, let you fix a bridge that just collapsed so you can use it. These are just a few of the cool things you can do. I was skeptical about how this would all work, but it didn't take long for me to get the hang of it and have lots of fun. With very colorful graphics and a decent soundtrack, this is a title that I'd recommend for your collection. Blinks 2 Masters of Time and Space came out a couple of years later in 2004. There's quite a bit added to this sequel and that's always a good thing, right? Well, let's see. The overall gameplay is very similar to the first. You have a cat that you can customize this time around and I guess you can make it look like your own cat if you have one. You still have the same abilities to mess around with time and the levels play and feel very similar to the first. In which I mean you do three missions and then fight a boss. One big difference is that you don't have to finish a level in under 10 minutes. You can take as much time as you want and you also don't have to kill every enemy like before. 
Probably the biggest change is that you now do missions as part of the enemy pig gang. These are more stealthy missions where you try not to get caught by cats and for the most part they're pretty fun. I haven't gotten too far into this game yet as I bought it just to show you guys, but I do like what I've played. Again, this one is pretty cheap and I got mine for $10 shipped and that's what, one and a half value meals at McDonald's? Eat a couple of bologna sandwiches instead and you'll have this game in no time. Alright, we're coming right along. Some good stuff so far. You liking the console? Believe it or not, yes, I am liking the console, but more about that later. Okay, <laughs> let's get back into the game. The Xbox had the ability to run games in high definition and many games took advantage of this. Games like Soul Calibur 2 from Namco. This one runs in 720p, which is something no other console at the time did. Not only that, but it runs at a locked 60 frames per second as well. This is an excellent fighting game that was released on all three popular consoles at the time. This one had Spawn as an exclusive character. Normally, the game can run in widescreen if you play it in 480i or 480p, but in 720p, you can only play it in the 4x3 aspect ratio. This is because the game is pretty graphically intensive, even for a 480p game. Still, besides the 4x3 shape, it looks like it could be an early Xbox 360 title or something. Battle 1, fight! <laughs> Another game with 720p support is Terminator 3 Rise of the Machines. And you'll be happy to know that this game is every bit as crappy as the movie, if not even more so. It's a first person shooter where you play as Arnold. The frame rate is all over the place and it often gets a bit choppy, so I'm wondering why they even bothered with 720p. But hey, at least it's in widescreen, I guess. Fantastic. It's a very forgettable game, let's forget about it right now. A much better 720p game with widescreen is Freedom Fighters by EA. This is a third person shooter set in a reality with an alternate history. Russia has taken over New York City and as a plumber, you're the city's only hope. I guess they clogged all the toilets or something. The game is set up well, but the controls are kind of odd and take a lot of getting used to. Still, the game looks nice and razor sharp for the time. The text is super tiny as well, maybe even smaller than Dead Rising's text. And lucky you, you have a sewer for a hub world. It's really not bad if you can adapt to the controls. The best 720p game that isn't Soul Calibur 2 is The Warriors from Rockstar. You're in a gang called, yep, you guessed it, the Warriors, and you get to go around and do gang things. Things like graffiti, which lets everyone know who's boss. Run out of paint and you gotta break into a store and steal things in order to get money to buy more paint. I'm not sure why you can't just steal paint, but whatever. You also get to beat up on other gangs and cops. And have you ever beaten up a homeless person for no reason whatsoever in 720p? It's way better than beating one up in lowly 480p. Actually, it's a lot like Grand Theft Auto where you can choose to beat anyone up or not. There is a lot of fighting in this game. The fighting action itself isn't horrible by any means, but it's certainly no Streets of Rage. I like that a lot of the environment is actually destructible. Lots and lots of stuff to do in this one. Check it out. Some games even ran in 1080i like Enter the Matrix here. It's real 1080i too, not half-assed like the PS2 did 1080i. Still, it's interlaced, so it's far from ideal. Anyway, in this game, you don't even get to play as Neo, at least not in the beginning. I really couldn't play very long because of the way the camera moves. And just look at the way this dude runs. Who the hell runs like that? There's not much detail here, but everything is smooth and sharp. And it's fun to beat up the post office workers who try to shoot you with their guns. I've never seen a post office this damn big before, it's huge. I recall reading back when this game was launched that there are a ton of bugs in it, so buyer beware. You're not supposed to be here. <laughs> 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 
Dragon's Lair 3D is a better game that's also in 1080i. Basically, you play as Dirk and it's still the original Dragon's Lair, it's just an attempt to make a somewhat more modern game out of it. You have a lot of the same stages, but played in a 3D world with polygons and stuff instead of quick time events. This game also adds a lot of new stages. And it's kind of interesting to see how they handled everything. Despite some slowdown, it looks great, but you know, I'd still rather play the original low-res Laserdisc version. The last HD game I'm going to talk about is MX vs ATV Unleashed. Wow, what an exciting title for a game. This is a racing game that goes up to 1080i and it looks pretty good considering. You can race in MX, which stands for motocross. You can also race as an ATV, which is one of those four-wheel all-terrain vehicle thingies. I didn't find these vehicles very fun to race on because they were really easy to fall off of. And lastly, you can race dune buggies, but the game calls them sand rails. These are actually pretty fun. Despite the extremely floaty physics and generally unpolished feel, I'd say this game is worth maybe $5. If you see it for less than that, you might want to consider picking it up. All the games that I mentioned in this segment were released on other consoles as well, but they only run in 720p or above on the Xbox. Well, unless they were also released on PS3 and PS4 like the Warriors. This is Crimson Skies, High Road to Revenge, released in 2003. It's a very arcadey flight combat game, and that's exactly why I like it so much. Sure, there's lots of story here, and it's actually really enjoyable because it's so entertaining. It really has some good voice acting and lots of comedy that will make you laugh. The game is played in a sandbox style. I mean that you're flying around a map screen and that you can activate missions by flying close to an icon and hitting the X button. The missions are all really entertaining, and besides flying, you can actually control a gun turret to take down enemy planes. Speaking of planes, they're all fictional, fun to fly, and have different attributes. You'll unlock different types of planes as you progress through the game. Graphically, it still really holds up and is a blast to play even now. The only sad thing is that the Xbox Live Online multiplayer is gone. Joe and I used to play quite a bit of this game online, and we always had a great time. Probably because we weren't in the same room. Even though the multiplayer is gone, the single player is still worth long hours of fun. If you have an Xbox, then this is a game that I insist you have in your collection. Hell, you can get this for less than $5 shipped, so there's no real reason not to get this one. The reason it's so cheap is that Microsoft started packing it in with the system at one point in order to show off Xbox Live. Let me know what you think of this one. This is Oddworld Stranger's Wrath, released in 2005. You play as the titular stranger who goes about catching outlaws and their friends dead or alive. Did you just say tits? The gameplay is in both third person and first person perspectives. In third person, you do your platforming, climbing, and melee combat. In first person, you use your crossbow. Your weapon can handle two different types of ammo at a time. The ammo for your crossbow is all types of bugs and furry creatures that you can find throughout the levels. Each one does different things to your enemies, which gives you time to collect them for their bounty. There's quite a bit of detail in each level, but the colors used are mostly dark and drab. It's an interesting game, but I had quite a hard time with the controls and the camera, which really pissed me off early in the game. I do like the idea behind this title, but I think the tough controls and difficult camera kind of turned me off to it. If you've played this game, what do you think? Do you have a hard time? If you haven't played it, it's really hard for me to recommend it as I'm just not a fan. <laughs> Here's Forza Motorsport, developed by Turn 10 Studios and released in 2005. This is Microsoft's answer to the popular Gran Turismo series of simulation racing games. As you may or may not know, I'm not a huge fan of simulation racers, and I would gladly take an arcade-style racer any day, say, like OutRun, but I'm typically an easy-going guy, so what the hell, I'll try it. Right off the bat, I've got to say that I like the fact that you can just jump right into the game. You buy an economy car with some credits that you have, and you start racing. This is much better than stupid Gran Turismo where you have to qualify for a freaking license first, which wastes a lot of time. There's many modes to play from, including arcade and career mode. Career mode, of course, is the main attraction since this is what you'll race in to build up credits to tune your car and buy new ones. There's different types of races here, from point-to-point -point racing and also lap tracks. Some are real courses and others are made up, and I'm fine with this as I think there should be different types. 
Racing is pretty solid and it's the usual speed up on straightaways and come to an almost complete stop at tight corners which in my opinion is boring. After placing and winning races you get credits to raise levels which qualify you for sponsors. These are good because you get discounts on sponsor parts. Graphically the game looks really good even today and there's still some very nice lighting effects here and there. The in game music is decent but the ability to add your own soundtrack is even better. If you like simulation racers this is a good game. In all honesty I had a decent time playing this title and may even look to buy a current Forza for my expo. Voodoo Vince is a 3D action platformer from Beep Industries. You're Vince, the third best voodoo doll of Madame Charmaine. However, she's kidnapped one evening and some zombie dust brings you to life. And what's the first thing you do seconds after becoming alive? That's right, flash some dude. Ew, dead monster smell. Anyway, I didn't think I would like this game very much, but it's actually quite fun. You can double jump, punch, and do a spin attack. You can also collect these purple idols which give you voodoo attacks. Once you have enough voodoo power, you activate this by pulling both triggers at the same time. This causes damage to you, but since you're a voodoo doll, it also damages all of the enemies in the immediate vicinity. Pretty clever actually. You collect more and more of these purple idols throughout the game and it's always fun seeing the new attacks and watching your enemies die in funny ways. The control is really good and the game has a very lively feel about it. The levels are pretty big and there's often a lot of things you'll need to do in order to clear a level. The visuals are really nice and the music is something else. It's probably nothing I'd ever listen to while I wasn't playing the game, but it's definitely unique and fun to listen to. There's going to be an HD remaster of this game coming for the Xbox One soon and also for the PC, so be sure to check it out. I think I might pick it up. So the Red Dead Redemption trailer just came out as we we're making this episode, so I thought I'd take a look at the game that started it all, Red Dead Revolver. This game mainly plays out as a third person shooter without many frills, but it's still fun. But don't go in expecting any open world sandbox gameplay here. This game began development under Capcom believe it or not and it was going to be part of the Gunsmoke universe. But then Rockstar purchased Angel Studios who were the developers making this and took over and added their own flair. So as you probably figured out by now, this game takes place in the Old West. Thank goodness you have someone like me here to tell you these things. You play as Red and you shoot almost anything that moves. In fact, the enemies keep piling on. At the end of each stage you get some cash and also the chance to repair or upgrade your weapons. For the most part, the game plays pretty well. It's really fun shooting down thugs. There's some challenging stages like this scene on a train where you've got to duck under the structures and jump over the platforms in order to make it to the engineer who's at the front of the train. If you don't jump over the platforms you get taken further towards the back of the train and you got a lot of ground to make up. There's also some quick draw sequences and these are hard to master. They're also really hard to enjoy. The graphics are average and while it supports widescreen it's also letterboxed at the same time. Still I enjoyed it despite not really being into cowboy type stuff. It eventually came out on the PS2 and even the PS4. Alright, we've got some good stuff again covered here and I always wondered that, you know, if if Sega didn't get out of the console market, I mean, what we wouldn't have had some of these Sega games on here. Indeed. Indeed. But lucky Microsoft, I guess. And then we've got one more Sega game coming up at the very end, so stay tuned. Here's Conquer Live and Reloaded, released in 2005. This is a remake of the Nintendo 64 game Conquer's Bad Fur Day. The story is simple, just like it should be. Conker had a long night of drinking with his buddies and all he wants to do is get home and go to bed. But he's distracted on the way home and ends up helping lots of characters with their problems. I really enjoyed the original game so it was an easy decision to buy this version. Utilizing the power of the Xbox I was excited to see what the game would look like on a then current gen system. It looked amazing at the time and honestly even now it looks really good. 
Rare did a great job with the remaster and left almost everything intact. On the Nintendo 64, this game pushed the limits in terms of language and adult themes. A lot of that is here, but some scenes were censored and for what reason, I'm not sure. Maybe the Xbox audience is less mature than the Nintendo audience? Oh well, it doesn't matter because it's still a great time. I've always loved this game because it's so colorful and all the areas you visit are just loaded with atmosphere. There's always a tune going on in the background and as weird as it sounds, it reminds me of Disneyland. The only bad thing is with many of the games we've talked about in this episode is that the online multiplayer is gone. This was another great aspect of this release, being able to play with up to 16 others in online matches. It sucks, but there's nothing you can do about it now, so just enjoy the single player. The Nintendo 64 version goes for a lot of money now, so this is a cheaper option. It's around $30 or so, and it's a fun time to remember what Rare was like when they were at their peak. Another great game by Rare is Grabbed by the Ghoulies. In this one, you and your girlfriend take refuge from the rain in a huge mansion that's luckily close by. Just like Splatterhouse. Uh-oh. Of course, your girlfriend gets kidnapped by Baron Von Ghoul right away and you have to find her. Lots of bad things happen to your poor girlfriend throughout this adventure and it's kind of funny. The game has kind of a wacky control scheme where you use the right analog to attack, but don't worry because it's very responsive and it's easy to get used to. Each room in the mansion has many enemies to kill and some of the rooms require you to meet certain criteria to move on. Again, don't worry because it's not too tough as usually you only need to kill certain enemies. A lot of the backgrounds are destructible and hold enemies or helpful items. And the Baron keeps it interesting by regulating how much health you have to make it through a room. It all seems strange but it works and it's pretty fun to play. I like the atmosphere and cartoony look of the mansion and the music fits perfectly. Rare did a great job with this title and it's a shame that there never was a sequel. I recommend this game and now you're obligated to own it. Do you like mech games? Then Mech Assault from Microsoft is a fairly decent one. The control screen makes it look like it's going to be insanely complicated, but it really isn't. Run around in your mech, shoot things, step on things, wreck people's lives, and generally be a menace. Well, that's not really the objective, but come on, that's how you're going to play it. It's pretty responsive with good sound and nice visuals. Kind of tough at first, but that's okay. This is exclusive to the Xbox. There's also Mech Assault 2 Lone Wolf. This is another exclusive for the Xbox. I'll be honest, I didn't enjoy this one as much as I did the first and I got bored extremely quickly. You're not much bigger than a regular man, at least not at the start of the game, and no mech game should have such tiny ass mechs. That's really not interesting at all. This one is in widescreen though, but the visuals are really only okay. I had a really hard time aiming my missiles as they'd rarely hit what I wanted them to hit. I ended up spending most of my time fight clubbing the city. There's also an annoying alarm when your power is low that I'd prefer didn't exist. I'd recommend Steel Battalion, but since we don't have that, we can't show it to you. Now, Burnout Revenge was also released on the PS2, but believe me, you want the Xbox version. First off, you know I like this series if you saw my reviews about Burnout 3 and Burnout Paradise. Basically, the more crazy you drive, the more boost you'll get and the higher your scores. This game is insanely fast. Often you'll crash into something that you simply didn't see coming at all. This is one of those games that you have to play for a little bit in order to get into the zone. Once you're in this zen state, you can pretty much dodge most obstacles, but it's still very challenging. There's lots to do in this game besides simple races. Sometimes you gotta take down other racers before the time runs out and things like that. So now you're probably wondering what makes the Xbox version so great specifically. Well, first of all, all the versions are in 480p widescreen and run at 60 frames per second. But the Xbox being what it is, the graphics are noticeably better than the PS2. And then there's the sound. Holy crap is the sound quality of this game amazing, especially if you have it hooked up to a properly tuned home theater system in Dolby Digital. You hear other cars and the wind whooshing behind you and also at your sides. The sound field is intense. 
There's plenty of discrete subwoofer when you initiate a boost in some cars and especially when crashes happen. The sound in this game truly does enhance the gameplay, it makes it way more intense. Now I've played plenty of video games in my time and very, very few sound even close to as good as this one does. The PS2 and GameCube have absolutely nothing that can compete with this kind of audio. Now you may think they do, but they don't. This game compares favorably to most modern games released these days, at least as far as sound quality goes. And if you haven't figured out by how long I've been going on about this, I am a sucker for good sound quality. I mean, I used to tune THX movie theater auditorium, so my appreciation for audio is probably a little unhealthy. I really wish that I could share the sound that I hear with all of you on YouTube. Oh, and the Xbox is also the only version that allows for custom soundtracks. So instead of the licensed nonsense of the other versions, you can put your own music on the console and listen to that as you race. Unfortunately, I don't have any custom playlists on the console right now, so what you're hearing here is the licensed stuff. There's an Xbox 360 version of the game, and I rented it once. It looks better, of course, but I don't recall it being quite as good in the sound department. I'm going to revisit that one again, I think, in the future. Also, the way the 360 handles custom soundtracks is kind of wonky in comparison to the original Xbox. The music is just like playing all the time, if I recall. It's, it's weird. Anyway, this game is a must-have. And if you own an Xbox, the PS2 version just won't do. This is Dead Man's Hand, developed by Human Head Studios and released in 2004 by Atari. It's a first-person shooter set in the Old West. The story is about your character, El Tejon, who was a member of the Nine Gang. You wanted money, but you didn't want to kill anybody. The leader of the game disagrees with you and shoots you. Luckily, you don't die, and now you get your chance to take revenge on the gang. Fortunately, you've changed your mind and have no problems killing people now. I like the Old West setting, and even though the game is all earth tone colors, I still think it looks pretty good with some decent detail. You carry four weapons with you at a time. A pistol, a shotgun, a rifle, and a knife which I never use because there's so much ammo lying around levels that you never run out. You can also get dynamite along the way which is pretty fun to use. The gameplay is straightforward and the developers tried to include a chain counter which gives you more points if you chain together kills. Personally, I really didn't care for this or even try to chain shots as it didn't interest me. But one thing that I did find interesting is that between levels you get to play poker. If you win, you're rewarded with attributes for that level like ammunition for your weapons or power for your power shot meter. While not an amazing game, it's still a good time and the Old West theme is a nice change from the other games in the genre. And of course, how can you have an Xbox console episode without the flagship series? Well, we just did, so see you later. Just kidding, this is Halo. I've talked about it before and you all know that I'm a fan of the series. I've always liked the Halo universe and Master Chief is about as cool as it gets for a character for this type of game. Hell, I even like the majority of the enemy designs too. Fighting all over the Halo ring is cool and there's at least some nice variety in the different levels, albeit a lot of them are dark. Hey Bungie, there's nothing wrong with a bit of light here and there so you can see, right? Bungie? Hello? The ability to take control of different types of vehicles also adds to the fun. <laughs> Halo 2 came out a few years later in 2004 and man Bungie added a lot to this sequel. In single player mode you get the option of playing the campaign by yourself or co-op with a friend. This was cool and really made playing the campaign a lot of fun. The story alternates between playing as Master Chief and also a Covenant Elite called the Arbiter. This was a great idea, but I did have problems at times since you're killing your own type of people. Let's just say there was lots of friendly fire out there. Speaking of fire, you can dual wield weapons this time around and it's very convenient. Other times though, I like to just have one weapon so I can lob grenades with the other hand. Besides these great additions, you have the usual stuff that made the first game so great. Lots of great guns and of course being able to use the enemy's weapons is always fun. I love the Needler and the Plasma Sword. Vehicles again are present and are as fun as hell to drive. Multiplayer is fun but the loss of online action really sucks since this was a great part of the package. The game was also given the widescreen treatment. It was patched soon after it was released. That's because the HUD crept into the overscan area of the TV specifically in the widescreen 480p mode. It's impossible to get this patch anymore if you don't already have it on your hard drive, but these days it doesn't really matter. Even if you're not into the first person shooter genre, this is still a great experience. Cold 
Fear from Ubisoft is a cool survival horror game. Like Resident Evil Revelations and Carrier on the Dreamcast, you're put on a ship during a storm. You're not given too much to go on story-wise in the beginning. It plays in the third person pretty much like you'd expect, and what it does, it does pretty well. It plays pretty much like, say, Code Veronica, where the camera follows you but also does the angle switching thing. At first you're shooting Russians that are still human and very much alive, but something has definitely been going down on this ship. Were they conducting experiments of some kind? Was there an alien virus or something? Well, it's up to you to find out. The gameplay is very smooth and responsive. The visuals are also quite nice for the generation and the widescreen really helps out with a game like this. The sound, as always for these types of games, is mostly ambient and it works. Be sure to check it out if you like the genre. It was also on the PC and PlayStation 2, but it doesn't support 480p on the PS2. There's too much water pressure. I can't open the door. Shenmue 2 by Sega is awesome. It's not for everyone, but hell if I care, I love it. You're Dio Hazuki out to find Landy to avenge your father's murder and maybe play a little Space Harrier on the way. I mean, come on, your dad's dead, he's not gonna mind. This was the only legit way we could play the game here in the US and it's the only version with English voice acting. That is, of course, unless you get into the hacking scene. And what fantastic acting it is. How about trying Lucky Hit? A part-time job, huh? Can I play? Yeah. It's $50 a game, and the rule is... I want to ask for directions. Honestly, I wouldn't have it any other way. This version is also the only one that lets you adjust visual filters on the fly for no reason whatsoever. Thanks, Sega. We really needed this feature. The world is much bigger this time around compared to the first game. It's also all on one disc instead of four. Probably the biggest flaw with this game is that if you haven't played the first Shenmue, it starts out kind of slow with very few objectives and next to no story. However, they have included a digest video of the first game on the disc for you to catch up. It also comes with a more extensive DVD called Shenmue the Movie which covers all the events from the first game. The graphics haven't been updated much from the Dreamcast version and the sound takes no advantage of the Xbox's 5.1 surround sound capabilities. Still, it's an amazing game and I had a hard time pulling myself away from it when I was capturing footage for this episode. I cannot wait for Shenmue 3. Right! Left, left! Left! Ooh left, 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 left! Push the number of times that I tell you! And lastly, here's Spike Out Battle Street from Sega. This is an arcade-like beat-em-up that's an exclusive to the Xbox. It's based on the Spike Out series from Sega, which I've never played aside from this particular game. Anyway, you're battling to restore peace to the island and there's tons of characters that you can eventually unlock and play as. The game is pretty damn fun at the onset, but I feel it might be a little bit too difficult for most players. You only get one life and then it's game over for you. But once you unlock new stages, you can continue from there. The fighting itself is okay. You have a punch, kick, and a jump. You also have a charge move, which at times can be a little difficult to pull off. You also have a special attack for when enemies surround you. These are represented by the little lightning bolts underneath your life meter. It took me forever to figure out how to activate these, which you do by pressing all four buttons at the same time. There's also weapons and stuff that you can pick up and fight with. How you pick these up, I have absolutely no idea. I've never been able to pick one up when I wanted to. I've done it on accident a few times, but it really shouldn't be such a chore to pick these things up. The graphics themselves and the music are both pretty good, but they're not gonna blow you away. I like that the game is in widescreen, 480p, and 60 frames per second like a lot of Xbox games actually are. It's a good game, it's just not balls off the wall amazing. I'd recommend it, however, the price is really starting to get up there. Here comes the boy. All right, there we have an Xbox episode chock full of awesome games. Mostly awesome are, games. Mostly awesome. And I, I think all of them are pretty much, um, what, what you might call it? They're only released on the Xbox, and, uh, yeah. except for PC. I know we're not forgetting the PC games out there, a but we're just not considering this a PC episode. Yeah, a lot of them were multi-console, but they were definitely mm -hmm. best on the Xbox. On the Xbox. And that's the thing. When I had the Xbox back in the day, I'd always get the Xbox version because the Xbox version would 
quite often be the best. Yeah, yeah, 40p, sometimes widescreen. Exactly. And, you know, just better graphic fidelity, 5.1 digital surround sound, mm -hmm. lots of great stuff. I loved the Xbox back yeah. then. <laughs> back <laughs> I mean, then. I still do, but back then it was really, really cutting edge. It really was. Anyway, what do you guys think of the Xbox? What did you think of it back then? What do you think of it nowadays? What are some of your favorite games? In the meantime, let us know, and thanks for watching GameSack. Hey, Joe. Oh, hey, Dave. Uh, can you help me move my Xbox into the other room? I want to play it on my HDTV. Let me get my back brace on. Cool, you get the system. Come on, I got the component cables. I got a hernia. All right, Dave, we've got just one more thing to carry up. The Duke.